I'm delighted to be here today with Ira and Brad. And those of you who have been watching the channel for a while know that I've had Ira on before several times talking about Austrian economics. And uh, Brad has joined me several times talking about the measurement problem. Um, but today we're here because we're, we've read this book, The Natural Order of Money by Roy Sabag. I think that's the right way to pronounce his name. Um, I ran into Roy Sabag's work through a conversation that he had with Jordan Peterson, which I thought was a very fascinating conversation. So I got the book, I read it, I asked Brad and Ira if they would like to talk about it, and we've all read it. It's quite a small book, it's very interesting, and even if we may not agree 100% with everything he says, it does bring out a lot of very important ideas. And uh, so we're going to talk about this book, but before we get started, uh, Brad and Ira, I wonder if this is the first time you two have met. I wonder if you could kind of introduce yourselves to each other, give a minute or two background on yourselves. So um, maybe Ira, since you're on the top of the screen as I'm looking at it right now, I'll ask you to go first. Okay. So actually, I had one other conversation with you, Karen. The last one was commenting on Brad's conversation with you because I thought it was oh, such a good, right. yeah. So it was such a good conversation and interesting and bring up lots of important issues, you know, which I think again come back to this, I think the potential for this conversation as well. So my background is uh, essentially an engineer, but uh, with um, and up through the PhD level and, and teaching and a lot of work and fluid mechanics and biomechanics and things as sort of research area. But years ago, uh, I had a, a situation, you know, say old enough back in the first Bush administration, you know, where there was a lot of economic questions and I had never taken any economics courses, anything, really read anything directly about economics. And this was just the sense of, as an engineer, as somebody looking at the world, say there are people taken as experts that say they've calculated things, they make predictions, and they're totally wrong. And that continued over and over and over again. And so from, I got to that point where I wanted to study this a little bit and figure out what's going on. And I happened at that time to, to have made a friendship with, with an elderly woman, actually, she was in her mid to late seventies at the time. And I was 20 something you know, in grad school. And turns out she had been a close friend of Ludwig von Mises and his wife. And Ludwig von Mises, for those who don't know, was sort of the great 20th century economist of, of the Austrian school. The others have come after him, say Hayek and, and Rothbard. Uh, but anyway, I, on the, as I was thinking about this and, and and went to see my friend to go out to lunch or something, sitting on the table was but Mises' great text, Human Action, which is interesting compared to Seabag's book. You know, yeah, the, Human Action is oh, like this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a, it a totally different you know, order of magnitude of, of work, uh, but where they overlap and it's something that I could talk about today. Uh, and anyway, from that point on, uh, I've would say I'm in the Austrian camp, at least, of understanding the world of economics, which is so much of what we do, you know, in everyday life is about if getting back to that fundamental things of what we'll talk about the book of where is that bedrock? It, it, our modern world gets so abstract away from the real reality, the real economy. These are the terms Seabag will use, we'll talk about. Uh, but there was something here that said, okay, now the world is understandable, in my perspective anyway, using this understanding of, of the economy. So that's where I bring to this conversation. Well, I was first introduced to uh, Austrian economics in 1981. So probably about the same time as you're talking about. Actually, a bit of earlier than, than a little bit. You got a little earlier because it was still during Bush. For me, it was a, during no, but the, first term. This Bush didn't start till 88. Right, yeah. So you you're talking eighty eight to ninety. Yeah, maybe I was at that time about ninety where I first. Okay. Because I never heard yes, of. Because he came after or... Reagan. Yeah. Yeah. It all gets mixed up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so yeah, nineteen eighty one, and what struck me when I heard these very 
erudite guys talking about this and I, I was in a week long conference on it was this is reality. It was just so obvious to me that this is the way reality works. And I was a very new Christian at the time. And that really got me started thinking about this whole concept of reality and where do you get in touch with reality in every aspect of your life and certainly in the economic sphere the way that austrian economics lays it out is as close as you can get to where we interact with the economy at that stage of reality anyway brad go for it <clears throat> okay so my name's brad i grew up i grew up on a farm uh my family wasn't very rich we didn't have a lot but we had a lot to eat um we also had a slaughterhouse so through all this i i had my grandparents on both sides grew up through the depression i grew up very close to them um, learned a lot of lessons about money i can remember my grandfather teaching me about saving and that's how you buy things you don't you don't ever buy anything on credit uh it's a trap don't get involved in it it, it was drilled into me from when i was very young um, so when things started to go, uh, I guess, into the more Keynesian type economic theory in the 70s, I can remember my grandparents and my parents arguing around the dinner table talking about this. What are they doing? This is not going to end well. Um, the, the deficit spending and how that would get out of control. Um, so I ended up going to school to be a uh, mechanical designer. So I design automation equipment and uh, you know very close attention to detail and things and and have to work with budgets and how we uh, cost machines. So I learned a lot about how, how pricing and everything works in a business. Um, and then when we got up against the uh, financial crisis in 2007 and 2008, um, I was watching the uh, you know, the bailouts online and C-SPAN and uh, trying to figure out wh what's going on here. Why why do they need this money and what's what's happening? So I really started to take a deep dive into uh, economics at that point and figure out, well, you know, why is healthcare? Oh, the other thing was the healthcare bill that they put, you know, Obamacare. You know, it's like, why is healthcare so expensive? Why is college so expensive? So I started to really start dive into, you know, the, the mechanisms of inflation. You know, I've come across the Mises Institute, um, Ron Paul, listening to him a lot. He was running for president, you know, in the 2008 timeframe. So um, I, I am still in a deep dive over this uh, because it really opened my eyes. It's like everything my grandparents talked about, what they, how they grew up and how they managed money, that's, that's the Mises perspective on on finances and and, and the economy. So, um, the Austrian school. So I I don't I'm not like really well learned in it, but I really see the practical aspect of it and how how everyday people, in, at least in where I grew up and you know and uh, my family, they all lived that way. All our neighbors live that way. It, it, it's like now, um, and, and I'll just say this, I think that back then we actually had capitalism because you would have to save up, you'd overproduce, save up capital, and then you could buy something. And now it's more like creditism where everything everything's credit. So capital mm -hmm. formation is like not even required anymore uh, or very little of it. So it's been really interesting trying to figure out, um, you know, like, well, how, how do we get out of this mess? Um, I'm not <laughs> sure about that one. How, how do you uh, how do you replace this mess with something that'll work? I don't think that's going to be easy. Um, but I do think that it's possible, and I do think it's going to be a ground up effort. You know, people from that have to deal with getting by day to day, there's going to be something that's going to come out of this organic, I, you know, so that's kind of where I'm coming at this from is, is just that very um, down to earth kind of farmer mentality, I guess. So. Well, that that's one reason why I think this is going to fit right in with, with Roy's book, because <clears throat> um, 
as I mentioned to you guys before we started recording, I thought a good place to start might be with chapter four, where he actually gets into the main thesis of the book. The book is written in an interesting way because in each chapter, he sort of lays out an idea <clears throat> and uses that to produce a term. And then mm -hmm. now you have a definition for that terminology so that when you move on to the next chapter, that terminology encapsulates a whole chapter previously, and then you can carry that chapter with you as you go. And then he just continues on that way. So it's in some ways, it's a very simple book um, very simple to follow his line of reasoning. And uh, he differentiates between what he calls the real economy and the service economy. And the real economy includes what he calls energy embodiments. He spends a lot of time laying the groundwork for what he means by energy embodiments. But I think very briefly, it is that um, food and fuel and then the elemental things that we use to um, produce tools and machinery and so forth that allow us to get at the food and fuel, those three sectors are the what he calls the real economy because they're the closest to the earth. They're the ones that actually have to negotiate with the real world in order to produce what is vital for everyone's um, survival. So energy embodiments are food and fuel and elementary materials. And uh, those who farm the ground and those who um, get the fuel out of the ground, and then those who get things like iron and uh, tin and lithium and all of the other things that are in the ground that we need for production, those are the members of the real economy. Then the service economy is anyone who is, who and, and this, 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 diff, this division can only happen when you get past the subsistence level of a, of a society because at subsistence level, obviously we all need food and fuel. You can suggest that, you know, it, actually the table of contents is kind of interesting too, because it's a short, very punchy paragraph on, what each chapter is about. So for that chapter four that you were just describing, he says, the human cooperative system is also thermodynamic because in chapter three, he said, nature is a thermodynamic system. So there is a chain of temporal energy dependency in which the first cause of an economy is those who work with nature to source foods, fuels, and elemental substances. The real economy generates energy embodiments. The service economy, only consumes them. The perfect cycle of the farmer's activity, the real economy, is beholden to a natural standard of measure and, yeah. and reward. So you, right there, you know, there's some things, certainly the one thing that I think a lot of people might say, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is not the case. The service economy only consumes things. You know, yeah. It yeah. puts the service economy in a very negative way, I would say, just first look at oh, that. So in reason. the chapter, he actually goes into that more though. Yeah. Um, but, but he does repeat that a number of times. So it does leave the service economy hanging out there. But honestly, the service economy also includes the people who are building the machinery that's being used to dig the stuff out of the ground and that's being used to enable the farmers to farm their ground and to increase their capacity and all that. So, so I think there's a little piece kind of left out there. Right. I was when I was reading this, I, I kept thinking about uh, like you have rings of economies around each other and there's like the Russian nesting dolls, the economy within an economy within an economy that they're all and they're all tied together. So um, to try and pick out like where does it start? That's kind of a challenge because I, I personally think like the real economy is the earth itself. It provides food, the fuel from the sun, water the carbon cycle, we exhale carbon dioxide, the trees breathe that in, give us oxygen. There's a, like, what we, almost like a, like an exchange of elements all the time in the earth with us that we just take for granted. We don't even think about that. But as you start going up levels from that, then we start 
like consolidating some of those elements and and then making another level of economy with them. So like you were saying, a subsistence living, it, you know, the earth provides everything we need. So there's an economy there though. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to think about it like that. So I think the one um, the one way I would I would push back a bit about that, Brad, is and this comes from the, you know von Mises say what what was the title of this treatise? Human action. So mm -hmm. that part of all these things that are going on, there certainly is an economy in the sense things have to balance in nature. You know, things are happening in that system that human beings are tied into to get what they have out. But economics per se, the part that is about what we think of as economics, and, and I think a lot more, is the part where the human being interacts with it. You know, that's yes, right. That's the I, sense of it. Yeah, that is what this we're is a definitional about. thing I'm talking about. Is that that that's the part that you say, well, that's economics. Maybe it's, it's not even necessarily what what is in this book, but that's what we would say is the economic part, or at least the I would say the Austrian view. So, and I was thinking about that, and I agree. That, like when we think about economics it's it's at a level it starts at a certain level up to another level you know and multiple levels in between but what we're doing in here is also affecting what we have in our natural world um so like clean clean air is an input for us and if we're just doing something in the economy that's affecting that now now it, it you know, so what are we going to do? Put air purifiers on our house and things. So it's going to cause economic activity to try and straighten out the mess we made. Um, so I don't live too far from that East Palestine, Ohio, where that oh, train wow. was. Oh, wow. And my, bro my brother-in-law lives four minutes downwind from there. And, oh, no. Uh, it, so it's, it's a mess, right? So, so to that, you know, honestly, when that was happening, I was reading this book and it's like, really, you know, it's, <laughs> you got to tie everything together. There has to be a thread from the very, very bottom all the way up. And I think right now there's some people that want to either worship the earth or ignore that it's part of it. They need to be integrated, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, that's my only point. And you know, from, from the sense of how money works and things, I don't know if the natural needs to be brought into it, but they are with carbon credits. That's mm -hmm. what that's going to be about. So um, it's just something to, that I wanted to bring up. So well, I, I think I, it's I'm really glad you brought it up, Brad, because to me, one of the things that, one of the reasons that I thought this book was so interesting is that he ties together um, well, on this channel, we've talked a number of times about this idea of how every individual has to interact with reality, because mm -hmm. every decision that you make, you're, you're pushing up against consequences. And um, sometimes you find out that your decision was a wrong decision because reality kind of bounces back at you and, and says, no, you can't go that way, you know? Um, and... Uh, so Brad, you and I talked about this idea of measurement, that measurement um, is one of the ways that we find out how we're interacting with reality. We find out whether or not we're measuring up or we find out whether we've gone too far. Um, kind of makes me think of this quote I heard the other day from Martin Shaw in one of his conversations. He said, limit is the difference between growth and death. And I thought, wow, <laughs> you know, that's where we get into trouble all the time is not knowing where our limits are, coming at that from both directions. We may not recognize our limits, so we go too far, or we may think I'm too limited here and that's impossible for me. And so then we don't go far enough. And so this idea of limit and measure, I think, is very interesting when you put it together with, with how the economy works. But Sibak's idea about the real economy is that the, the farmer is the one who has to always negotiate with the land, with the air, with the water, in order to um, turn out a crop. 
Maybe he has a year when there's not enough rain. He still has to find a way to produce a crop. Let me just read his, his little blurb on chapter five. Ecological accountability is a fact of nature and of all human cooperative systems. Only the service economy is able to artificially and temporarily ignore ecological accountability. When ecological accountability is manipulated or forgotten, the relationship between the real and service economies become parasitic. The natural standard, natural measure, maybe, uh, Hmm. must be reified and extended to all members, ensuing that ecological accountability remains at the heart of cooperation. So I I think that's where he's coming from, is, is that sense of, there certainly seems like so much of what is called the economy, and again, going into now our state of affairs today, it's become all financialized. Like that's the reality for the United States is finance. Yeah. How money moves, paper moves, digits moves digitally, not say manufacturing, not making something, or maybe not even farming. We still have quite a bit of farming, but maybe not mining, not drilling for oil, not doing any of the things that are what he calls the real economy. And the farther you get away from that, the more likely it is that you can do things like, say, modern monetary theory, which says, back to your point, Karen, essentially, I would say it in in a phrase, there are no limits. That's what modern monetary theory says. The government can print up all the money it needs to do whatever is necessary. No limit. So there we see how these fundamental ideas get turned into at least a reasoning for political action that has huge consequences. Right. Well, at I the same wanna... time, the earth has resources have limits. Exactly. Well, yeah. that's, that's the whole point. I think the Austrian view would be yeah. um, is some point, you know, there's, and there's lots of websites you can talk about that, you know, see there, there will be a day of reckoning. You can get away with things for a while. Human beings do things acting as if there are no limits. And someday the limits will smack them you know, hard. And, and we see what, you know, what comes up after that. The farther we go away from that, the longer we go away from those limits, the worse that reckoning would be. Well, I, I totally agree that the earth has limits, but in times past, that argument has been used to say, well, we have to greatly decrease the population of the earth, or we have to keep the population from increasing. I can go back to the 70s when in my first marriage, actually, yeah, very early 70s, when we were told all the time, you mustn't have children because of overpopulation. So we almost decided not to have children because they had convinced us that there should be no more children. I'm so thankful that I didn't listen, you know. Um, And one of the interesting things that I learned from Israel Kirchner at this conference on Austrian economics is that at every critical juncture in world history, when it looked as if the resources were not sufficient for the people on earth at the time, some massive sea change happened either intellectually or technologically And that catapulted us into a new era of more abundance. And at the time, when I heard this in 1981, we were being told again, there's not enough resource for the people. We've got to cut back, cut back, cut back. But right after that, a few years after that, there's this big technological revolution with the internet that opened up massive resources all over the earth that most people didn't even know about because we didn't have access to all that information. So it's not that the resources weren't there, they just weren't known about by most people. And now we can trade this information back and forth. Oh, we've got this over here, we've got that over there. So, so where that, I would say what you're saying really intersects with the economics and understanding it is for human beings individually and then as a society, we need to exchange information to know what the real limits are. Yes an accounting, a measure, and with that, to be able to make decisions that do bring us 
more well without destroying the, you know, for instance, you know, we could save money on maintenance of trains, you know, rolling stock, and will be more profitable if you don't have to pay for the credible cleanup of the accident that you caused by doing that. I mean, that's a, not a proper accountability in the law, say, which intersects this. But in terms of the book, what that comes to is the honest money. It's when the right. money is not honest that these things spiral out of control like we've never seen in the history of the world, it seems like today compared to previous times when these things have happened they've ruined countries but they haven't seemed to ruin the world like it seems to be going on now so can we just hold off on the money for a little bit until we establish this <clears throat> issue of ecological accountability um so i want to go back to what brad said and but i want to also put in here that when when Roy Sibag uses this ecological accountability. He has a slightly different definition for it than he's not talking like the green people talk when they talk about ecological ecological accountability. He says definition for ecological accountability is that all members of a cooperative system are accountable to the natural standard of measure and reward. The real economy is directly subject to this standard. The service economy is subject to it indirectly because its members are temporally and energetically dependent on the activity of the real economy. So everybody, whether it's real economy workers or service economy workers, are dependent on um, this natural standard of measure and reward, which, as Brad was reminding us, is built right into nature itself. You know, how much how much production you can get out of a field with just natural fertilizer compared to coming in with, say, um, manufactured fertilizer that comes from petrochemicals, um, or how much you can get out of a field, like in California, which is basically a desert, <laughs> huh. we're still the breadbasket of the world because they bring in all this water to keep the fields going, but then that water is coming from someplace else where they don't have it anymore. So, right. um, yeah, so anyway, Brad, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, I think, so like when we talk about resources, and there, that's something that that, um, that I learned maybe, maybe about 10 years ago. It's like, we're not short of petroleum right now. We're short of petroleum that's easy to get at. So the, um, so the amount of energy it takes to get a barrel of oil costs more now than it, in, in, in terms of energy, it costs more energy to get the energy back out because it's deeper, it's in harsher environments. Um, there's a lot of, uh, like copper is the same way. There, there was copper mines out in the United, uh, Western United States. So the copper was just laying on top of the ground, huge nuggets of it, or, you know, they'd gather in and now it's a lot harder to, to mine. So when we think about like resources not lasting forever, they won't. I mean, at some point we're going to run out and we're going to have to recycle things. We're going to have to really get clever about how, how, where we get these elements from to make things. You know, it may it may be millennium before that happens, but it's going to happen at some point. Um, so you're talking about not having limits, and then you also mentioned about like, and I, I you know like the ecology movement is don't have kids. So it's like live without limits or don't live. But really, I think what the Austrians are kind of trying to tell us is live within your means. You know, don't it's uh it's not a you know to go to the extremes and mm -hmm. how, how how do we live there and so um and i think i think this book he tries to to capture that you mm -hmm. know in, in what he's trying to to convey to us and and a method for how, how that could be restrained how those limits can be brought back in so does that make sense what yeah, yeah. And I think that leads right into what Ira was saying before about money, because his his whole point is that 
when we got away from a natural standard of money in the United States, that's when the, the whole spending kind of got out of control because, and for those who are listening, who may not know anything about the background of standards of money, um, when I was first learning about this stuff in the late seventies, actually, I remember there was, there were two decisions made. One was to completely remove us from the gold standard as like all the gold in Fort Knox was all the money that the U S had was the gold in Fort Knox. And then all our dollars had to be pegged to those, that gold. I think that was 19, what was that? 1933 or something. No, anyway, no, I, it's a little bit different. The second move that, or do I yeah. have it backwards? The no, Brett no, Boys it, thing. No, so 1933, Roosevelt confiscated gold. Gold was circulating money. You had oh, gold okay. coins and silver coins, and the gold was confiscated and then put in Fort Knox. And to, it, to, to show you the level of, of what can I say, uh, double dealing, they said, and this came like, I think was even not even through the Congress, pretty much just the first hundred days, we're going to take all the gold. And the, the standard price was $20. That was always a $20 gold piece. And based on the weights, which is in the constitution, you know, it's only, that's the only money. And paid everybody $20 in paper or something, you know, for their gold, gold coins. And then right after that, they said now it's thirty-five dollars. They devalued, you know, the money immediately after they just handed it out. You know, so right. that was that was pretty double dealing there. And th those depression era. That was my parents. You know, grew up in that time, and I I agree. You know, there's a different sense of what you do about debt and and, and other things that that came from it. Well, anyway, that was the case in the '30s. That was 1933. In the war, the war economy was one that was very, very far from, well, the whole Roosevelt administration was very much in the mode of the times, socialistic, fascistic, that was, you know, everybody loved Mussolini, you know, the trains were running on time, Hitler was, you know, a miracle in Germany, and that was the organizations that were building up through the depression of having the you know, economics boards and labor boards and you know centrally run kind of planned economy. And then World War II came. By the way, in 1941, the unemployment rate was still something in the order of like 14% in the old way of counting. I mean, depression wasn't over in the sense people didn't have stuff and people still were unemployed. And then they went through the war where people really didn't have stuff. Now there was rationing for everything. You know, in terms of an economy producing the things for people, it was nothing. Certainly, they ramped up and prepared, you know, made things for war, and that was very successful. Well, then come Bretton Woods, which again is a real history of who was there at Bretton Woods. It was the conference, in New Hampshire, I believe, uh, that came up with a new system for money in, in the world. And we based on the dollar would be the backing basis for everything. And then the dollar would be based on gold. So that went on, that was, so you had a, if, if, if the United States was honest, that system potentially could work you know, because circulating gold itself, the, the metal itself can be troublesome. You, know, you want to do things easier. You know, you have the gold kept one place, but then you have certificates or you know, electronic digits or something to trade. So anyway, this goes until the 60s. In the 60s, of course, we have guns and butter. You know, we're trying to run the, do all these things, maybe going beyond limits with the Vietnam War, the Great Society, etc. And the amount of money that was being created by the Federal Reserve, which is our central bank, is another whole question. And, the, and their whole, our, our debt being growing by the government, such that it got to a a point, and especially the French, which I you know a little about the French, they were going to the, the gold window and saying, okay, we have all these dollars and we're noticing what you're doing over there. We want gold. Here's, here's my $35, give me an ounce. Because that peg stayed for all those decades of $35 an ounce. 
And then in 1971, August, mid-August, I don't remember the exact date now, 15th maybe, Nixon came on, there's a short thing, for a while we're gonna cl close the gold window. Now that's never come back. And so now we have what's called a complete fiat system. It's just the trust in the good faith of the US government for holding the dollar or the European Central Bank for a Euro or a one or a ruble or a yen, whatever it is. And we have this floating system of fiat money that is not based on certainly nothing. There is no certainly ecological accountability in CVAX terms. Well, and this, is, this is why the gold is no longer one price. Gold used to always be the same price. Right. It was $32, then it was 35. You know, I would not say a little that. bit, but now now gold can be thirteen hundred dollars an ounce. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, an ounce. I would just it's not quite that. You know, dollar was a quantity of gold. You could get on sort of the you know, purity of it, but a, you know, a dollar, you know, was supposed to be an ounce of gold. And right. that kept it fixed. And then it was the prices were of everything else related to that measure. It's 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 the um, gauge that Brad would have for understanding everything else because we know what right. that is. It's pure, like a purity. You say we're comparing everything to that piece, and that way we can we can go between other things by comparing it to, to gold. So it had to be, you know, by that was an ounce of gold was a dollar. Then you could say it was, or not an ounce of gold. An ounce of gold is more like a, a silver dollar. But um, 20 ounces was, uh, or 20 dollars was an ounce. Yeah, and that was that, that was the thing. It was that was the definition. That was, and so people carried gold coins that were an ounce. So that became 20 dollars. Yeah. Well, see, in, in the late '60s, early '70s, when we saw this coming, my husband and I actually bought some gold coins because we could see this was coming. Um, mm -hmm. In later years, I was convinced, oh, you know, that that's that's never going to be worthwhile. So I ended up selling it. <laughs> Not very smart because I think the day is going to come when, instead of Bitcoin, we're going to need little bits of gold here and there in order to buy our way around. Well, there's lots of things to talk about that, you know, in terms of philosophy. Uh, and you have when we had one of our last talks, Karen, with with uh, Sevilla, and we were going back to the. I think we were based on that conversation of the Bitcoin philosopher i can't remember his yeah. name now or whatever so it, and i can't remember which conversation it was I, I think it was another peterson conversation with a real bitcoin advocate who i can see his face I breed breed love i think Robert his name breed is. Love, yeah. oh, that was the yeah. other one yeah breed love was the one that karen has but there was a guy on with um he's from uh, lebanon i believe lebanon or palestine who uh, originally but he's he's okay. academic and he was a former engineer and then from that, you know, started to understand, you know, the energy and real things. But anyway, what he said Bitcoin is, different things what Bitcoin can do, though, is a measure of energy because it takes energy, this mining process, to create a Bitcoin. So in his way, anyway, we, and perhaps it could be argued that that's not correct, that he's not not get he's not he's not correct in that assessment but i think it's as interesting he, he could make a statement that's so close to sea bags in this case of saying well it's got to come back to that real thing of energy you know you, you could come back to some other thing like labor or you could you know that, that that's the thing of, if we get into the criticisms of this you know that's maybe where i would start to go of what that accounting of how it what it gets to be, and and even because even uh, gold can have can be inflationary, where all of a sudden, which was sort of uh, say 16th century Spain, where all of a sudden there's this tons of gold arriving from essentially almost no cost, certainly not the same cost it had been over the centuries of trying to mine it, because those other people totally separated showed up, you know, they took it. And, and brought it. So the cost of stealing it essentially from the South Americans and the you know, Mexicans and things, Aztecs and the Incas and all that was so much less than had been the cost of 
mining gold for millennia, that it caused an inflation that really destabilized Spanish society. And some say I've seen it connected to even going into, you know, why was there the Reformation and things like that. All that stuff that happened in the 15th century was a sense of the inflation destroying the, the existing order, which is another really important uh, fundamental of, of trying to understand this money in relation to society. You know, what happens when the, infl what happens like Brad, when your gauge is bad, you know, everything you're trying to do gets messed up. You, you uh, can't I, function I never properly. knew about that historical connection before. <laughs> Oh, have you ever heard that before, Brad? That that uh, I mean, I guess I should have thought about it. That all the gold coming in from the Incas and the Mayas and you know whatever mm -hmm. um, would have had an inflationary. Yeah. yeah so yeah, I mean, it it, it, it's a different kind, certainly, than the fiat money we've been going through, or say you know, the Roman Empire of cutting the coin, you know, making them more and more base metal as opposed to you know, the amount of silver, say, in it. Well, see, that's the interesting thing. All this stuff, it, there's never anything new. This stuff goes yeah. all the way back. To all the way back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, there's, a, there's so many things about money. You know, when we were talk, started this off, I was talking about how, the, like, the economies are nest, there's a nest of different layers of, of the economy. And I you talked about the financialization of everything. So, so we have this, just, it's so far away from, connected reality that it uh, but we have to have one money that works from there all the way down and it, it doesn't work like that i don't think it works like that you know um so i i really believe a, a big part of being able to use money is being able to trust it and i don't trust our money i don't even know what it's worth and tomorrow well, it's going to be worth less you know <laughs> So, so I would I would put a, an issue, you know, the way you just described it and something I think a lot of people in, say, the Mises Institute orbit, you know, are trying to think about things, at least some of them, is one sense is say, well, look, if you have honest money, that'll go everywhere and create your moral society because you have an accurate gauge to trust people. You know, here's your money. But there's another view, and I think it's something maybe that I would say is more necessary. Maybe you first need a moral society that then would fall on a real measure of things, like a real money. Yes. It's, it's, you know, yeah. it's like the society is going bad, and then one of the symptoms right. is you go to a, to a false measure of things, then rather than one creates the other one yeah. going the other way. It's hard to it, tell which it, way it's, it's going. It's a historical thing. Yeah, which how which way yeah. that's really going. But mm -hmm. it seems like it could be, in our case, more of the moral failure. Well, so some, go, go ahead, ahead, Brad. I was just going to say, like, some of the things with, with gold as money, once we started getting into the Industrial Revolution, the limits of that were experienced. And how um to, to to have enough in abundance to be able to actually get it to the hands of the poor people too is another thing because it usually tends to go up and then it was difficult to get it back you know that it didn't get into a nice circulation pattern because of the oh the carnegies and everybody there's making so much money you know there's there's just a, a discrepancy in how that how that would work out um you know they used to have under the new york uh, fed federal bank they had vaults with all the gold for all the countries that the u.s still um, still still there it's still there a lot of it's still there and when it's at the end goes. of the trading day they would go down and physically move gold bars from one country yeah. to another there was yeah. an accounting every day and it was based on those gold bars and that's how they kept track of trade deficits and if somebody bought too much too many goods and they used up all their gold they were shut off. You don't get any more. No, that was the that was World War One. No. You know, basically, the nineteenth century was the gold a gold standard. You know, the mm -hmm. different little versions of it, but all the, all the groups, you know, started with Germany, then you know England and France followed and said, okay, but in war we can't honor the gold standard, and you know that for a lot of people that that 
that part of it was one part of Western civilization was over. <laughs> what made it rich and powerful had ended. You know, your economy's false, you're killing each other. It's, it's obviously we could talk about right. the, the spiritual and religious end of that, but it was, it was done at that point. Well, to me, one of the most interesting things about this book is the way he starts with thermodynamic energy and, and the idea that energy is always conserved. And I, I'll talk about that in just a second, but then he takes that all the way through to the end and talks about why is gold the best option for a, a uh, standard of money that connects us deeply to reality? And he gets much more philosophical in that last chapter or two. I thought it was really, really interesting. But, but going back to the thermodynamic system thing, um, he says, okay, so first of all, the simple fact that we must eat and must sleep in order to maintain our vitality reveals that the body is a thermodynamic system which is constantly subject to the dynamic interplay between generation and deterioration. In case of living organisms, biological metabolism is the sum of the processes that convert energy through a chain of physical chemical reactions in order to provide life and movement to the body. This energy is given in the form of food and water. Now, energy, the magical feature of our natural world, which we implicitly take for granted, mag it is magical, Energy is always and constantly conserved from an external source, then expended, and then reconserved. So I, I have to depend on a farmer to get the food for me, but then thankfully he can produce more than he needs, and so he's willing to sell some of it to me. And I get the food and I eat the food, so I'm consuming energy. Then it takes a certain amount of energy for me to live. But then if I have an idea, oh, I, you know, maybe, maybe part of it is taking care of my children, but maybe part of it is that I have an idea for something that I can make that I can sell to somebody else. That energy is then conserved in this ideation, conserved in this manifestation of reality that comes out of my thought. So I'm consuming energy, but I'm also using the energy to produce something that then can be useful to somebody else. And this whole cycle takes place throughout the whole economy, um, which is why in you know part of the service economy, I said, is not just somebody going to his office. And I mean, one of the examples he used was in the real economy, uh, a miner goes out and digs coal out of the ground. In the service economy, uh, an engineer goes to his office and writes code for a few hours. Well, the reality is that code can also be instantiated into something that is real, that's functioning in the world, like a, like an iPhone that produces all this possibility for information to be conveyed across the planet so that people can find out where resources are. So, but it's all this cycle of consuming energy, um, expending it, and then turning it into something that conserves that energy somewhere else. And he goes all the way from that idea all the way to the end where he talks about the purity of gold and why gold is a better store of value because, for example, he talks about oil. Oil is obviously very valuable, but oil can degrade over time. It either starts drying out or it starts um, losing some of its volume when it's underground. And so in order to store oil that's already been extrapolated from the earth, they have to use water and it uses up a lot of energy and, and resource in order to conserve the oil, where gold is conserved just because it's such a pure element. And so the, I, I just thought the way he tied the whole thing together was a very beautiful idea. Mm -hmm. But, you know, from a, I would say a physics thermodynamic point of view, it doesn't really make sense. You, you don't conserve energy in the gold. You can't then take the gold and use it as another energy source. 
Yeah, well, I wasn't, I, I, I wasn't trying to draw that connection. Yeah, so, so but it's from this, the beginning, he talks about us as humans. This is where I'd say is the, the, you know, a critique of that way of, right, trying to I tie thought, the things in a way that if you, if you, you know, stuck to the definitions of, you know, we're talking about a thermodynamic system as a mechanical engineer, we would take our thermodynamic system and look, talk about what energy is there, what's the useful energy there, say, the, you know, difference between the enthalpy versus the energy, different types of energy, etc. That's not encompassed in the gold itself, in the sense of being re, you know, being able to use it later, where oil has energy in it that then can be combusted and used, and that energy converted into mechanical energy, converted into heat, converted into several things, you know, that are are useful. So. It's something a bit different than that direct chain. Well, but I think he, what he's when the only reason I brought up oil is that in his conversation with um, Peterson, he was using oil as an ex he was using oil as an example of what would not make a good store of value because yeah, it so costs the, too much to maintain, but that gold makes a good store of value. Um, yeah, I mean the, the classic but, things with money, with money, gold is money is because yeah. it doesn't degrade. Yeah, it it's it has a good value density related to other things. You know, you could make iron money, but to have enough amount of iron that would buy a loaf of bread, you know, might be a couple of kilos that you have to carry around instead of a, you know, a, you know, a, a small ounce or you know, even much, much less than an ounce. You know, one of the problems with gold, back to one of Brad's points, and had been, is it was too, too valuable. Uh, too de valuable. So, you know, what do you do for a poor people? They don't get, you know, for their amount of gold, they can't even get, oh, like one gold ounce would have been more than their pay, you know, for a month. So that's silver, you know, so it could be another one or other ways of fractionalizing things, you know, you know, gold still can be split apart and, and done some other other things to it. So we say uh, stores value well, has density, but one of the biggest is that everybody wanted it. You know, it's the most easily tradable commodity. Everybody, you know, historically, you go around and says, "Look, you know, I've got um, I've got some sheep, and you know, you've got uh, you've got a daughter." You know, say. Uh, uh, let's let's trade, you know, uh, you know, gold or gold for sheep, or you know, that guy has a daughter. You have sheep. You have gold. You know, we we could have a system of distributed labor because of there was a money, a money we all trusted, believed in, wanted that somebody else would take after we we took it for our product or our service. So. You know, that's certainly one if you go to get a lot of Peterson uh, type of, of evolutionary arguments, you know, that's what history has given us as the best money. You know, it took well, when, an act. When you, when you talk about what people want, um, the other day I was hearing this um, discussion about uh, diamonds and water. And I thought it was such an, I mean, it's a point that a lot of people have made but this goes back to what Brad was saying. And so maybe Brad can get in the conversation on this, um, that diamonds are, are rare and hard to dig out of the ground and, and beautiful and everybody wants them. And so they're extremely valuable, but water is actually the most valuable thing that we have to keep us alive. We have to have water um, even more often than we have Sorry, to have Karen. Getting back to Brad's point earlier, air. You yes. know, usually paid for air. Yeah. That'll kill you. If you don't have air, you'll be dead. Yes. Yeah. We don't pay for air at all, but we'll, we're willing to pay a little bit for water, but we're willing to pay a lot of money for diamonds. Unless you're out in the desert and you're dying of thirst, then you're going you're gonna to give all your diamonds for a pint <laughs> of water. Right? right. And I'm sure that these people in Palestine, Ohio, would give the shirts off their back for some clean water and air to breathe right now, right? Yeah. Yeah, the water is mainly the problem. But um, have you, either one of you, ever heard of tally sticks? Have you ever heard of that term? No. So right alongside gold, there's coins, and the, uh, 
the people used uh, an, an account. It was, it was a ledger. It was made out of sticks. Um, I might have it. I don't know if I can share my screen or not. I'll show you a picture of them. Um, can I share my screen? Oh, yeah. Here. Just give me a second here. There you go. I'm going to just share this real quick. Did it share? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can see that those sticks. Mm -hmm. These are called tally sticks. And they used to use this as a count. They used these clear up until the 20th century in certain parts of Europe. That's what they used for money. So gold and silver coins were hard to come by for the poor folk, you know. So what they would do is they'd take a stick and they'd notch it different ways. And those notches meant that maybe this is a hundred and this is tens and this is a five and these are ones. So that's how much debt one person had for an, to another. So maybe you bought a cow and it would cost, you know, a hundred pounds or whatever in or what, what do they use in england sterling um so then they would take that stick and they'd mark on that and then they'd split the stick long ways and then one person kept the stock that was the person that gave the money you know that was they're the stockholder and the other person was the borrower and they were they owed this debt to the person holding the other side of the stick yeah, I wouldn't um, call that money though. That's the credit it's instrument. Cre it's credit system, but they would actually once trade these that. were established, they would trade these sticks yeah. for money. Yeah, that's that's a class that happens all the you know, that's what bonds are traded. That's all these right. so that's, exactly. like, that's like fractional accounting, right? <laughs> <laughs> Action yeah, <like> so <laughs> basically what the whole point of this was is the wood grain, and they say it right here is authentication factor that because they would only those two sticks would match back up to each other no one could counterfeit them i see i see yeah, that's but, an interesting that's a cool idea yeah these these go back they found bones that are like forty thousand years old and the tally marks those are the like the four slashes yeah. with the line through them they were on these bones so they they were using account ledgers and scribing things that you don't even have to know how to read to use these Brad, this is this is you, you put it you know if you go watch these bitcoin guys they're going on the brilliance of satoshi that's what the same thing he's trying it's, to it's do right here well it's yeah this is kind of like ethereum where you can do the contracts but it's yeah. yeah it's it's basically it's a ledger that can't be interrupted it can't be tampered with it can't, can't, can't be, be falsified it's, it's non-centralized. The thing of and it is, both people, yeah. both people, people have to trust each other. And then they had, they actually, in their court system, they had a way to mediate if people. They actually recognize these as legal tender. As well, a I'll tell you one of the problems I see, though. This means so you have to know some some relationship between everybody who's in the system, because what if like I took this, right? I, I made a trade right. in England. I went to China and then gave it to somebody. So. They, the other person they know with the tally is. stick can never get <laughs> get back to find you know the person who had it. Yeah, they would stir their paint with it because they didn't know what I, don't know what it is. Yeah. So but, that's that's the limit of this type of money because it's yeah. very very localized, you know. So it's kind of why it died out is when the industrial revolution came and and products and everyone started using railroads for trade. Okay, now this money you can see where it has its limits. I don't know why like uh, Ethereum type. Uh, contract that would be easy to do between two people couldn't replace this but well that's the I, whole I, idea that's the i think the bitcoin is more the standard and again i'm not a but the, bitcoin the expert, is with, but they have a ledger you know the ledger's out there right. in the world it can't be corrupted it has to that's the right. mining is somebody has to say among all, everybody on the ledger that you know this is a good transaction the people have it the bitcoin can trade it so the thing is with Bitcoin, and I, I was all gung ho with Bitcoin, you know, for several years. I started buying Bitcoin, and what you find out really fast is that it is limited by the exchanges. Your yeah. access to the ledger is the problem. Yeah. Well. And so, so you could never take Bitcoin onto a national level 
you probably couldn't even do it regionally. It, the transactions would take so long. I think it's up to, oh, I don't know. I think this, the author of this book, um, Roy, he talked about this with Peterson. It's up to 580 gig, the ledger for Bitcoin. Mm. So there's no way you could go into a convenience store with your phone and buy something with Bitcoin and have it connect directly to, you, you'd you have to download it and, but and use unless it. Unless you had, again, people who, their business was to make transactions with Bitcoin easier and then you trust them and yes. you have something right. in between, right. which happens to And, and we've old. seen how that works out. Right. Well, and so you what have that to have does, the trust still in the system. You know, this happened. The trust still needs the to be there. And people, then the the centralization comes back i mean in a way it's not it's not decentralized that now you're going through these exchanges to to get to to the bitcoin ledger and that's where i found the the where i started to see where it was going to be a problem yeah i think um, i i never could buy any i so i i think there are problems with it even to the point where even like really expert people you know economists and they're just quoting them uh, well, one Austrian economist said, I studied this for two years, and this is what I found. So if you have to study <laughs> your, your money for two years, that's a problem. You know, it's not yeah. tangible to everybody. And so there could be, now on the other hand, it's got this supposedly software limit on the total number. That's never going right. to, you know, a fixed number that's not going to change. You know, it's got some other things there where I think some of those people, like the one I forgot his name already again after you said it, you know, that we had discussed earlier, are very philosophical and reflecting on these problems and trying to come up with solutions. So, you know, again, I would give them credit for that. Is it the perfect solution? Was gold the perfect solution? No. I mean, we, we're human. We live in a real world that has limits on how any one of these things can, how, how well they work. Well, I think the thing is, for me, remembering historically through my life, the big problem is when you get too far from the source. And I mean, that when Bitcoin has to go through, you know, all these other channels, then you're getting too far from the source, you're getting too far from the ledger. In, in the and, and early... every layer adds a, a fee. Yeah. yeah. It, it, so it, then it becomes really expensive to use as well. So, well, the sorry, other I didn't way... mean to cut you off, but. The other simple way that we're getting too far from the source, I mean, a simple example that I can give is in the, uh, I think it was in the late 70s, maybe we bought a house um, where we would go to actually go to the local bank in our tiny little town and we would pay our mortgage at the bank once a month. And I knew the banker. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like 10 years later, we buy a house and now, there's some sort of mortgage company that holds my mortgage and I have to put a, a letter in the mail to that mortgage company. And then I go forward 10 more years and I start out paying to one mortgage company. And then like a year later, I get a letter, oh, this has been bought by this other big conglomerate. And, and then you, you fast forward 10 more years and then you've got fractional accounting and people slicing and dicing bad debt and putting it together into packages. And pretty soon, <laughs> The distance between the person who bought the house and where the money is has come from and where it's going, there's no connection anymore. There are no limits to this thing. Right. Now, what struck me about the tally sticks that I thought was so fascinating is they look exactly like a key. Don't you think the way they're cut? Yeah, they yeah some exactly of them look like even more like a key than those. And, yeah. And yeah. a key, a lock is built for a certain key and a key is built for that lock. And yeah, those two fit together. And that's about as close as you can get to measuring up to reality, right? Where when you're close to the source, and that key will open that lock. So um, I'm not saying we should all go back to tally sticks. But I just think it's really interesting how I don't know which came first the tally sticks or keys being cut that way. But um, I'm sure the tally sticks uh, from what i read about them in the past they they think they've been used for like 40,000 years 10 for sure that they found them in caves and things so it's some form of it they were using though they're so deteriorated it's hard to tell but um yeah it's, I, think, it's, I think it's the concept so this is this is the interesting thing 
it becomes, you know, economics, and you listen to and the economists talk about it, what they call it, the, the, the dreadful science or something, you know, it, it's so ridiculous, so far from reality, and nobody wants to listen to them, because frankly, it's all just a method to obfuscate and cheat people, you know, to get down to it. And it's the reality of something that's deeply human and natural, your time preference for things, you know, you can have this and I'll have something later. And how do we do? I'm, I'm the tortoise in the hair. I'm going to save up for the winter. I'm going to work hard now so I can have leisure later. These are concepts that we don't get away from ever. And that sense of you can financialize and make a mysterious curtain over what's reality is obviously, I think, uh, obviously, but I think is where, you know, why we, we are where we are, where so many people, you know, those rich people, they're at the other end of the money making, not ordinary people. And they create trillions of dollars like nobody's business. Right. At the end of it are rich people, not poor people, you know. Whether it's intentional or not, the system transfers wealth up. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if they did it on purpose. Well, you know, we got to say for those guys, they're not stupid. Right. So what right. do you think? It's intentional or not? Just by accident. <laughs> year after just year, for centuries, it just all well, happens to go to those people. But, you know. So what's what's happening now in the banking system is like kind of, I don't know if you got caught up in that, Karen. and I know you live out there, but yeah. um, that. No, that, we're, we're about as far away as you. I mean, Emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, everything we would wouldn't have anything to do with Silicon Valley Bank. Good. So we're safe. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I was wondering about it. I saw it's like, oh boy, I hope because I know your husband's involved with tech too. It's like, yeah, Ooh. yeah. Well, so, you know, Silicon Valley Bank was mostly mostly involved with um, funding startups and um, venture capital and, and venture capital and yeah and. Um, kind of making money float possible for those folks and all that although there were there were ordinary um people that were keeping their money there but mostly it was for the big guys which is why i think bailing them out was just such a stupid move yeah goes goes back to iris point yeah <laughs> i think the one of the things with the uh with what's going on in the banking system right now it, there's actually a shortage of collateral. There's not enough collateral to keep the bank balance sheets, uh, you know, above water. And it's yeah. happening all over, not just a few banks. It's all over the United States. It's in Europe. What is that telling you? They're consume, we are consuming more than we produce. That's what that's telling us. We're not living within our means at all anymore. And um, how, do, how do you fix that? How do you, how do you you can't you, print collateral? You tighten <laughs> well, your belt for you tighten your belt for a while. That's how you solve it. That's how it's well, well austerity, right? But it'll be okay. for not the imposed austerity. Again, the austerity of the people, you know, by but the real austerity would be, you know, that again, would have been obvious in this case, those people over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the accounts would have lost some of their wealth, they took a haircut. You know, that's, that those people, and I just saw Yellen was in the Congress. They said, well, you did it for that bank. What about my banks? You know, he was a guy from Oklahoma. What about my guys lending Small out to the farmers? Bank. Yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, no, well, maybe they might not get it. You know, you <laughs> can't make it up, you know. But here's I, here's a quote I just, this was in a, uh, in a, in a, column maybe only this week by a guy named James Kunstler. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, he's kind of interesting. So this is his quote. Money dies when it loses its direct connection to the generation of wealth from the real things of this earth. Fuels, crops, metals, materials, labor, and the value-added products made from them. Since that divorce has already happened, the need arises for something else that can function as money. A store of wealth, an index of value, in the medium of exchange. The government will pretend that a central bank digital currency is that something else. Since banking is now nationalized by the Federal Reserve, backstopping everything and everybody, then theoretically, all the wealth of the nation 
is under its command. That would be another illusion. So That's I think I think to say you know, the sense of somebody, you know, I don't think he read Seabag, you know, who's writing about this now, but this banking thing happened just now. This digital currency stuff is coming from the government. You know, certainly is they're all talking about it and planning. Um, it's a whatever perfect, we're talking about. It's a perfect vehicle for control. Yeah. Because for folks like me, there's way too much friction for using digital currency. It's way too complicated. It's too complicated to understand. I wouldn't want to mess with having to deal with the the day to day aspect of it. But the big savior comes along and says, "Oh, we're going to have national digital currency, and don't worry about it. We'll have a government website that'll show you how to, you know, and we'll we'll make it seamless for you. We'll make it easy." And then all of a sudden, everybody is captured in this because. We're just simple folk and don't know how to do this. And now you've come along and saved us. Yeah. My, point, my point in, uh, in, in just reading this was one is the connection to what Seabag said was so clear. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody else saying something of, of trying to you know, get a grip on what's going on, but how this really quite esoteric topic, you know, what, what are you getting, the philosophy of money or something, is so nailed down to the reality of our lives and will really be something we're all experiencing really hard unfortunately uh and then how to navigate each of us in our own way through this period where it seems like those fundamental things again that we want a society based on real things truth is is not it needs to be reconfigured somehow to the point where we get somewhere where we're functioning uh, more. We, do, we know that's not going to come from the top down. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just not, that's not going to happen. I read a book called um, Re Reinventing Collapse by Victor Orloff. He wrote it back uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago or so. And he was talking, comparing the Soviet Union to the United States and how they went head to head, you know, economically in this Cold War and the United States and the way he put it is they they won, but, you know, it isn't over yet. And that the Soviet Union, and I didn't realize this until I read that book, I looked into it a little more after that, is that they had a parallel economy running the black market in the, in the Soviet Union because people couldn't get bread, they couldn't get shoes. They couldn't, so they they would trade they had they'd use different foreign currencies they'd use whatever they could for for currency locally um and so it when the soviet union collapsed it really didn't cause a lot of problems because they were already used to taking care of themselves i, I think i think the, the way you could put this in like one quick phrase and what's needed everybody had a vegetable garden mm -hmm. you know, they, they weren't growing grass <laughs> right you know and you say, well, how do you get through something like that when systems break down? It's you have a vegetable garden, you know somebody across the way who has some different vegetables, maybe some chickens over. I mean, you get back to barter. Now, this makes everybody much, much less wealthy when you get to that point of an economy that way, as opposed to the distributed labor complex economies that we have. But that may be where we're going. Well, I think at least in part we will be. Yeah. I, I, you know, one of the things that that um, I wanted to ask you about what you what your opinion was. Ron Paul talks a lot about competing currencies. Yeah. He doesn't think that any country should have one currency. That it should be uh, the open market should determine what money is, and and what people use for a medium of exchange. What do you think about that? Well, that was uh, a proposal, at least attributed to uh, as a proponent the most was from Frederick Hayek, who was a student okay. of my thesis, and said this would be a solution. You know, in the fiat world, I certainly, for me, I certainly think that would be better than saying everybody has to trade in dollars and the government can, oops, excuse me a second. Okay. All right. Um, that, uh, or, you know, and the way it would really work to me was say, okay, I'll pay, I'll pay you in your fiat currency, but 
I can demand my own currency, whatever I want, you know. But I think now, like for example, contracts in gold and things I think are legal. I might be wrong about that. You know, in terms of there's also legal tender, you know, where you have to right. take a dollar to for payment. And I think those are problematic. I think Rothbard, because it was just an article by Lou Rockwell, you know, somebody who I, I write yeah, for. Yeah, I follow site. him too. Yeah. So I write, you know, on that site. Um, is was you know gold historically has come to be the choice, and so if they were competing, eventually you'd come back to gold anyway. You know, you get through that process. That's that's the evolutionary end game of that, as opposed to a bunch of competing fiat currencies. But well, so would that be a good intermediate? I mean, would that be a possible intermediary step for me to for, get back to gold? Because I don't think we're ever going to have governments say, okay, we're going to go back on the gold standard. But well, it maybe, might maybe. be possible but, to get them through this other intermediary. I think, you know, for, for me, you know, you know, certainly, you know, there's some reason to call some, you know, system capitalism or not. For me, it's a free market, you know, and in a free market, you know, okay, if I can agree with you, you know, let's do this podcast and we're going to exchange our goodwill, <laughs> maybe that's it. But we could say, okay, Karen, you know, pay Brad and I to be on your podcast, you know, something like that, right? Well, this, you know, my time's busy, you know, I mean, my time's money. I need, I need some. Well, then we could decide what what the payment is, and we can be allowed to do that, and and that's necessary for the working, uh, and I think the most moral way for the economy. But just to finish it because it comes up so much more. People recognize the supposedly free economy we have now is so immoral in so many ways. And that's where I would get back to with some others that we need to, between morally acting agents, sometimes not, e not even that, you know, the mafia guys can, can make deals that work. But more than likely, the better, the more wealthier, better off we will be is when it's based on the trust, the moral basis, you know, that we think is correct. And then that would go farther is to say is we're in communities where it makes a difference to me that the person down the street is doing well. As those people do worse and worse are living on the street, it's from a Christian standpoint, it's not good, but also just as a person, it's not good. And so this is, again, one of the things when you are globalization where all the decisions are made somewhere far from where the people are, the things right. are happening. It just goes, goes bad, you know, and, and, you know, I'm far from like a union guy, I think, but I've been living in France for a while, you know, and I could see why they get riled up. You know, they're, they're lied to a lot and, uh, and decisions are made that are not based on anything they can control. It's not like they're not working hard, or working well, but they flip a switch, they can move capital around, they can move the labor somewhere, and then people are left with, uh, you know, a, a dis destroyed economy and, and local society. So, well, somewhere really along the line, I, I think part of what really disturbs me is that we're really living in the 1984 world where all, so much stuff has gone down the memory hole. I mean, I'm by your lights, Ira. I'm an elderly lady because I'm seventy-five. Yeah, we well, had that conversation the first time. <laughs> I mean, at the beginning when you were talking about this elderly yeah. lady who's seventy-five, I'm thinking, okay, well, here I am. But um, I was, I lived through the time when part of what brought me to Christ was stumbling upon what looked like truth to me, but I later sort of thought, well, maybe it was a conspiracy theory, so I walked away from it. But the conspiracy theory had to do with a day in the future when there was going to be a digital currency that everybody would have to bear a mark in order to buy or sell using this digital currency, which was going to come out of, I think it was Brussels or something in Europe. And, uh, and the all this stuff I was reading was about and this was in 1979, 1980, about how the humanists were going to be educating our children to be good global citizens of the new world order. 
which at the time, if you talked about that to people, they thought you were completely nuts. And, you know, I didn't want to get separated from the rest of humanity by being carved out as a conspiracy theorist. So um, I tried to find other ways to understand how the world worked and, and move on from there. But yeah, here we are, yeah, I'm sorry. we're in the global order, the new world order, we've got anymore. the digital currency. <laughs> I can't say <laughs> this is impossible. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things that that uh, like the Federal Reserve Act, when they put the Federal Reserve in place, they also started the IRS. So they have us in a way because you have to pay your taxes in their currency. That is, from what I understand, why they established the IRS is so that everyone would have to pay a federal currency to the US government to legitimize it. Um, so when you were talking about fiat, I, I, you, you know, they, they make a fiat that you have to use it, but they don't make a fiat what it's worth, what its value is in weight of something or the, the value of it's never nailed down. It's always you know, floating inflation, deflation, and through those cycles, they transfer wealth. So I can't help but think that, that we, we really, and I know people that are honestly doing this in my area, they're growing animals and, you know, beef and hogs and chickens and eggs, they're, you know, selling eggs. Uh, there's quite a few people, vegetable stands and stuff. They're still using money for exchange, but I don't think it's going to be too long before they start trading you know, maybe a barter system or something, but, but you know, even that um, is taxable, you can't get yeah. past the taxes that way. Right. Right. So it, it's going to be tough to build a, a system parallel to what we have. Cause it's such a juggernaut and it's so intertwined with everything. Um, I mean, look, look at the stranglehold visa and mastercard have on retail everything that we buy has a 3% tax. We'll call it a tax. It's a fee built right into the price to cover the credit card transaction. They're like a, they get a sales tax on everything. Yeah, you don't think people, about there's it like a, that. There's a, but, somebody, you, you, if you ever come across uh, Catherine Austin Fitz. Oh yeah. yeah. She's a real conspiracy person but she has the thing is you know to use cash as much as you yeah. can you know it's all, right and, and pretty honestly much my wife cash most. my wife and i have been a lot yeah. lately trying to do that more and we shop especially after covid we shop local the small yeah. little hardware store and thing it's more money but i'd rather them be there and yeah. i can pay them cash look them in the eye and have a talk with them you know yeah. uh so <clears throat> So that's all part of, of the natural order of money, I think, is that, yeah. is that, is that human connection <clears throat> and local and regional at the, you know, to try and bring things back to, you know, it's going to be hard if, uh, <laughs> where are all our shoes are made in China? I don't know of any shoe factory around. Uh, there's a few that make like, uh, U.S. combat boots and stuff for the for the military contracts, but there's hardly any or textile mills. They're, so they're this, just this is again one of those things tough. that that follow. If you follow the say a fundamental aspect of understanding the economics, say the Austrian school say, but I think most economics schools is the distribution of labor is something that adds to the wealth of everybody. So. We, we can look at that, you know, the person who's better at making shoes and, and there's good arguments about why this, this works on every level, top down, bottom up. Mm -hmm. But, and this is clear, you can, you can know it as an individual, it makes you more fragile. Yeah, the supply chain is far yeah. more fragile. Yeah. You're, you're, it, so it gets to a point where it's too dangerous, you know, the, the fragility is such that it's dangerous. And, um, what was the, you had, you had somebody on years ago now, I think here, and I can't remember, early on, he had that great thing about the stability and strength, you know, like in the pagoda and, and other things, in architecture. Oh, yeah, Jeremy Kurt, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so it's it's like that, you know, you, you, and I know personally, you know, I like to, 
it's like my work day, you know, say when I was working, I, was, I like to do everything myself. So I, I didn't have the dependence when something could go wrong, even though it made more work. You know, in that sense, I'm not as, wouldn't be as wealthy in that sense, but there is, a, it's a personality aspect, I think, to that. Uh, but as a society, it's, it's clear we just can't have supply chains, you know, and, you know, on-demand things, you know, that's another big part of the fragility is not storing, you know, that's back to the depression, you know, what, it, you know, my wife goes, why do you got those cans down in the, you know, <laughs> like in the basement, you know, we don't have a basement, but got, yeah, who knows, maybe someday, you know, hopefully we'll never need it, you know, <laughs> I'm a terrible prepper, I am really bad at it, but I feel it, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I was a prepper in 1978, man. I had my house stocked. <laughs> yeah. And and we almost needed it. You know, if Reagan hadn't been elected, we would have needed it for sure. I would have needed all that toilet paper and tuna fish that was in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> um, this has been great, guys. I think we could probably go on for hours, but I've got um, I've got another talk coming up. So um I'm sorry, I can't pay you. When when the website <laughs> starts paying, I'll pay you. I'll say. Yeah, I don't think I'll be asked on when we start to pay people. <laughs> I never, nobody's going to pay me for my ideas, that's for sure. <laughs> so thank you, Ira. Yeah. Thank you, Brad. This has been great. Maybe we can uh, get together again on some other topic. But for yeah, now, to be honest, I, did, I didn't even get to the, the, the fundamental point I would make about this whole topic and that's the difference between this real value and subjective value oh yeah there's, like there's a, a yeah a that's, what my, that's, that's what my, one of my next conversation is going to be about actually um I'll just I'll just read this quote here um I should note that the subjective theory of value in economics, which is from von Mises, does not in any way imply that reality itself is subjective, but yeah. rather that subjects determine the value of an object and ultimately its price through their collective decisions. Yeah. But that was an excellent summary. That's from Luke Burgess, who writes a Substack, and he had a recent Substack on a topic he calls financial nihilism. Yeah, so because it is a bit, I'll get the whole thing, but when this subject came up and what was really came to me was for years, I had totally and still believe in the subjective theory of value as stated in the Austrian economics. You know, yes. I have a quote from Human Action. It is ultimately always right. the subjective value judgments of individuals that determine the formation of prices. Yes. And then at the same time now, over the last 20 years, at least, is this creeping subjectivity into everyday life that nothing is real, nothing now, is see, true. This would be a great topic of conversation because I've been trying to tease that out with people for a long time. I totally believe in the subjective theory of value, but the terminology has been taken over from us and been twisted. And so now if you talk about subjective theory of value, they think you're agreeing with them. Yeah, so it, it, it's, it's, it's actually, it's like, it's, it's a cognitive dissonance. That this, yeah. That's what I liked yeah. about this book. It got me to, okay, let me work that out. You know, so actually okay, I was going to well, write Okay, well, I can't do it now because I got to go, but let's, <laughs> let's use that okay. for our next topic. Okay? I wrote a little article that I was going to put at LouRockwell.com. You know, okay. It was my C's a postmodernist. <laughs> okay, so send me the link and I'll put it below in the description. Okay, this once, once, great, I, once I get your link, I'll put it in there. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. All right, see ya. Bye.